Good afternoon, everyone. I know as many are joining us for this session, I want to uh, thank our sponsorship, Biotronic, for this afternoon program and uh, welcome my colleagues and speakers, Clemens von Bergelin, Stefan James, Paul Cow. I'm David Kanzeri, and the, we welcome you to a session related to optimizing outcomes, <clears throat> excuse me, with a bi an ultra-thin bioresorbable polymer drug-eluting stent. Just to level set the discussion <clears throat> and as a brief introduction for our program, we've recognized for quite some time since the advent of first-generation drug-eluting stents, but even with second and more advanced generation drug-eluting stents, that there is a persistence of adverse events with polymer-based drug-eluting stents. And this has presented an opportunity for iterative improvement. In many geographies, for example, bioresorbable polymer drug-eluting stents have become a standard of care over predicate permanent polymer drug-eluting stents. But overall, when we consider at least the past 15 years of the evolution of drug-eluting stents, there have been multiple advancements, not simply related to polymer technologies, but also including uh, ultra thin strut and ultra thin, now ultra thin strut stent scaffolding, stent design modifications, and of course improvements as I've introduced in polymer biocompatibility, especially with the development of bioresorbable polymer drug eluting stents. And the bioresorbable polymer drug, drug eluting, the bioresorbable polymers more specifically, permit drug release with finite control, but at the same time permit dissolution of the, of the bioresorbable polymer material, and this eliminates at least theoretically the stimulus for neoatherosclerosis, late inflammation that's associated with stent malapposition or positive remodeling, and it restores the stent to that of a bare metal stent phenotype and perhaps confers a safety advantage. And in particular, at present, there have been multiple comparative studies comparing bioresorbable polymer versus permanent polymer drug-eluting stents. These studies generally have been of non-inferiority <coughs> trial design and have demonstrated clinical and statistical parity between the stent designs. We do, however, have one recent randomized clinical trial, the BioFlow 5 study, that demonstrated the superiority of the bioresorbable polymer sirolimus eluting or CSIRO stent compared with the durable polymer everolimus eluting Zion stent. So with that background and introduction, we're going to begin with uh, our first speaker, Stefan James, who will, um, who will review as of yet unpublished data with regard to bioresorbable polymer DES in the SCAR registry, as well as additional data with the Orsiro program. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, David, for, for that introduction. I'll talk about, it's my pleasure to talk about um, uh, to evaluate the broad clinical utility of ultra-thin bioabsorbable polymer DES, or CSIRO. And I will, as you said, uh, will talk s uh, primarily on observational data, including the SCAR registry with large numbers. Um, I have these uh, potential confl conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, you mentioned some of this, David, but I'd just like to show this slide for, as a starter of this session that we're talking about the Orsiris stent, which is built on, on a platform of cobalt chromium. Uh, it has a strut thickness of 60 micrometers uh, for the uh, smaller sizes up to uh, three millimeters, and above three millimeters, uh, the strut thickness is, is 80 micrometer. The polymer is a, a PLLA, and it's, uh, it has a, a passive coating and amorphous silicon carbide at the top. And the antiproliferative drug is serolimus that is uh, eluded during the first 90 days. And, uh, and if we'll just look back uh, at, at when the, in, to the design phase of this st uh, stent, I was personally, I must say, uh, I've been um, a little bit uh, skeptic at first to develop very thin struts, strut stents because <coughs> although you win on deliverability, you may lose on, uh, on uh, uh, on uh, radial strength. And there's a risk that you, you are able to deliver them, but they collapse, and you get higher risk of restenosis and potentially stent thrombosis. Uh, when the sponsor developed the stents, they tried to um, develop a th very thin strut, but still do not compromise with recoil and radial strength that these data show that they did in, in bench tests. But does this actually translate into good clinical outcomes? That's a question in reality. Uh, in, the, in the first uh, observation study, the BioFlow 2, two that enrolled 452 patients with stable CAD and randomized between Ozyro and, and Science Prime, uh, the, the primary endpoint was instant lumen loss at nine months, 
And, and that is the first way to show that the, that the stent holds its promises in terms of late lumen loss. And you can see that the late lumen loss uh, between the two stents were identical. And the results both for IVUS and OCT were very, very promising in the same way, showed that the, the mean lumen area was very low and the risk of increase of neo-intermal hyperplasia was also very low. So it seemed that these stents were able to achieve the results that they were designed for uh, with very good stent apposition uh, and they were actually covered very well uh, uh, with endothelium, which is the first uh, uh, requisite for, for low risk of restenosis and stent thrombosis. And the BioFlow uh, study showed a very promising low risk of target lesion failure at 60 months. You can see at one year it's about 5%, and at five years it's about 10% risk of target lesion failure, uh, similar to the comparator arm, the Science Prime stent. Also, the stent thrombosis rate was very low, surprisingly, uh, impressively low, uh, 0% uh, for definite stent thrombosis and 0.7% for all cause stent thrombosis. Uh, the observation study by FLOW3, 1,300 patients confirmed the low risk of target lesion failure uh, of 5% again at about one year. And this it was a, a broader study, included higher risk patients and, and, and a greater variability of different types of patients. So you can see that the results are consistent also with high risk patients, including acute MI, small vessel, vessels, and diabetics. And the bioflow, I'll, I'll just refer to it briefly. David uh, uh, mentioned it. it. It's a randomized trial on 1,300 patients, randomized again between um, Orsiro and, and, the, and Science Prime. And you can see a very interesting early separation of the curves, and then a very low risk of the primary endpoint uh, target lesion failure at one month. Maybe we have time to discuss the reason for this early separation of the curves. I have no idea myself. It may be related to the deliverability. Uh, that is so easy to deliver, so you don't uh, create uh, complications in the acute phase, and you s are able to uh, keep a very low risk of, of a target lesion failure, including both the low risk of restenosis and stent thrombosis. And this was very consistent also in very different subgroups, including different patient characteristics and lesion characteristics. So again, impressively low um, target lesion failure. So we looked at this in the SCAR database, which is a national, all-comers, inclusive registry, including all patients, all stents in Sweden. We've done this now for 15, 20 years, but this includes the last 11 years. You can see it's a pretty nice picture. You can maybe almost put this on your wall at home. Yeah. It's beautiful, <laughs> isn't it, all the colors? But you can see the different stents that have come and gone over the years. And, and, and now 2018, this is just recently updated, you can see that the Orsiris stent, 13,487 stents have been used, and it's, it's been increasingly used the last two years. The reason for the increased use, I think, is that we have been a little bit skeptic, as I said in the beginning, for thin strut stents, because we're afraid that they would, would collapse and create poorer results long term. With the confirmation in the observational studies and the randomized trials, I think the confidence is growing. So it's more, more and more widely used. Uh, you can see that, 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 that green spot. In these uh, uh, 311,455 stents, it's very difficult to see the different lines here and the colors, but, but it shows, uh, you know, in, in summary, that the older generation stents are the top ones, and the new, more ju new, newer ones are the, the bottom ones. And we do have the Orsiris stent here at the, the bottom one regarding restenosis performing very well, similar to other, I must say, uh, modern DES. Uh, keep in mind that this is restenosis, clinically relevant restenosis, at crude event rates, not adjusted for but differences in baseline characteristics. When we looked in, in the 142,496 stents that have been used most, most frequently in Sweden for the last 11 years. Uh, these are the stents that have been used the most. The Resolute, the Orsiro, Promus Premier, Synergy, Ultramaster, Biofreedom, Onyx, and Science Prox. You can see that the Orsiro is here. Uh, again, it shows a very low risk of restenosis of 0.6% of uh, over 12 months. And it stays low uh, for, for, for longer duration. And when we did a multivariable adjustment analysis, we, we, we adjusted for several uh, baseline clinical characteristics and procedural characteristics. We do have 
access to about 250 variables in the database to adjust for. Um, when we compared Orsiro versus other modern DES used primarily the last few years, you can see, in fact, that the promise holds true. The risk of restenosis is, in fact, significantly lower with Osiro versus other new generation drug elusion stents uh, with an adjusted hazard ratio of 0.56, statistically significant. With respect to stent thrombosis, again, 311,000 stents, and you can see that, again, the Orsiro is at the bottom of these, all these stents with a very low risk of stent thrombosis. It's been used now for the last seven years, so the, that, that uh, gray curve comes out to about seven years, and it stays low over time. Uh, and when we look again and at, at, at the most frequently used stents, 142,000 stents, uh, again, you can see Orsiro comes uh, out very favorably uh, of about 0.5% uh, risk of stent thrombosis, angiographically verified, so these are definite stent thrombosis cases. And the registry is built in a way that it's, it's mandatory to find these identify stent thrombosis. So we actually, I, I'm certain to say we don't miss stent thrombosis cases. And when we did the same multivariable adjusted analysis, you can see that the risk of stent thrombosis was similar, not significantly different from other uh, new generation DS. So I think we have good data to say that the ultra-thin strut by absorbable polymer or cyrus stent shows a very broad, broad clinical utility with consistently ro low restenosis rate, target lesion revascularization, and stent thrombosis rates in observational as well as in randomized trials. But I put my emphasis on the observational studies. And my fear was not true. Uh, the thin struts, the good deliverability does not compromise with the low risk of restenosis. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> Stefan, um, you can, uh, we'll keep you at the podium just for a moment if you don't mind. I want to, first of all, uh, invite our audience. If you have any questions, please <clears throat> stand up. I think we have some microphones, and if you could introduce yourself and ask questions. But um, we'll talk, let's talk further, too, about the trial data after Clemens's presentation as well. But um, the SCAR data has really, I think, since the introduction, uh, my knowledge of SCAR, the SCAR registry in December 2006 at a US FDA panel meeting, has really had a storied history in providing uh, important insight into the application of drug-eluting stents in clinical practice. I mean, you've shown this well with a high level of fidelity of, of clinical, tr of, 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 of endpoint data. And over the years, as you've demonstrated year over year, and from first generation to the existing generation of drug-eluting stents, there's this progressive improvement in clinical outcomes. And it seems measurable across all the outcomes, restenosis, TLR, stent thrombosis as well. I just wanted to get your perspective, first of all, is that is this a combination or an in, is this attributable to changes in technique, changes in pharmacotherapy, or changes in technology, or all of the above? How do you, how do you reconcile the, this, this gradual improvement? Yeah, th thanks a lot for the good question, and, and it's interesting that you have this long historical perspective <laughs> like, like me. And, and in fact, uh, just a short comment on the 2006, when we, our, our hypothesis at the time was to show that the new generation, or, or the drug eluted stents, the first generation, were superior to bare metal stents. And we failed, and we showed that there was a higher mortality and higher stent thrombosis risk. And, and, and colleagues were actually throwing egg, rotten eggs at us because mm. nobody wanted to see that. I was there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, was, it was pretty tough. But, but since then, we've seen a considerable improvement. Um, I think it, there, there are multiple reasons. The first couple of years were the first generation drug eluting stents. We did a pretty poor job uh, as cardiologists. We, we, we thought well, we had a solution for everything. And we could beat surgery, and we could beat everything. We, we did a poor job of implanting them well. We implanted too long stents. We were pretty poor at te technically. <laughs> We didn't understand how to uh, select patients for duration of DAP to increase DAP. We didn't have very effective medications at the mm -hmm. time. But since we have been better at implanting the stents, uh, we have better at in in diagnostics, intravascular di diagnostics. We have potent agents available. Still, we see an improvement. So there is something in the stent design that has improved considerably the last few years. Uh, there is, I think, it's a combination. We have, or the companies have found a, the right amount of the, the of the uh, other drugs, and, and also with bi very bio-friendly uh, polymers and the thin struts. 
it, we have tried to, in the database, to try to uh, differentiate the three important features, the stent design, the strut thickness, the polymer, and the drug. But it's very difficult yeah. uh, to sort it out. And, and I can't say that it's any one of those, but uh, I think the three in combination have really proved to be uh, doing a great job in, in lowering the risk. And it, yeah, oh, Ron, we have a question. Yeah. Ron likes uh, Stephen, very nice yeah. uh, presentation and a very elegant uh, registry data. So David was mentioned that 2006, we all remember those days that the impact on drop of utilization of drug eluting stents from 85% to the 50s in the US for a while. But is there any uh, ramifications for presenting those data on increased utilization of the good ones in these registries or potential for reimbursement? If you really outperform based on your registry, is there any mechanism that those things that do better can get rewarded by any way? I mean, anyone taking this data to implement yeah. uh, some reward for those things that are doing better? Uh, officially, it's not that way, but in, in reality, that is the way it works in Sweden and Scandinavia, I can say, not only Sweden, uh, which is maybe a challenge for some of the manufacturers if you come up with a new stent and we don't have you know, data on it. It's pretty tough to come to sell those stents in Scandinavia. Uh, physicians are very prone to look at these curves. Uh, we tell them always to be, be careful because, because it's observational. There's a lot of bias that goes into it but it's, it's, re it's really real world. Uh, so sometimes physicians are looking at this too much. We also need to accept new development. We don't, need, we don't want to see the development stop. We, need to see, we want to see even better stands in the future, if, if possible. Yeah. So we shouldn't stop introducing new technology. But this is an excellent instrument to have to use if there is a new development in trials, in observational settings, to really show how does it work in reality. But, but the community react to that. So for example, if you see that stent A doing better, then is that change the ut utilization or selection of stents for use within the customers in um, it, Sweden? Yeah, it changes directly. But not the reimbursement. Not the reimbursement. No, we yeah. don't link any registered data to reimbursement. We, don't, we want to keep it separate because of, because of selection bias, all sorts of problems. And, so, and, and for, for reimbursement, we want to look at randomized trials. More, Ste more stringent. Stefan, just to echo uh, or, or amplify upon um, Ron's comments too, if, uh, if you're an operator in Sweden, do you have access real time to the, to the SCAR registry data? Uh, in other words, where I was heading with it is that do you have real time to get feedback and see which stents are, to Ron's point, performing better, and then maybe adopt uh, the utilization of those? Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the success stories with the registry that every operator has a possibility to go online every day because it's updated every night. Wow. So you can go online today and see your procedure from yesterday. You can see your eosinosis rates in your diabetic patients as compared to the, your, your colleagues in your hospital or co your hospital compared to the other hospitals. And it's updated constantly and we always get reports back. Terrific. That's the reason that the businesses are so eager to enter the data. They prioritize entering the data in the registry before, you know, writing their um, file, the notes in the files. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to make one more comment, though, too, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, randomized clinical trials in the context of clinical practice with Clemens, and I can't underscore enough the importance of these types of data because in the press conference last uh, two days ago, and the sort out data was being presented and one of the reporters said why did why do we still do these trials when the outcomes are so good and they seem to be so even but we only know that when we look for it right and and we would have assumed for example in 2006 that the des were so much better than the bare metal stents until we studied it one might argue the same for our experience with bioresorbable scaffolds yeah. too and 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 in many geographies the regulatory requirements for drug eluting stent approval may be relatively low, and so one doesn't know really what the outcomes are with these, uh, with these products until you really study them in clinical yes. practice as, as you all have done. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Stefan, and we'll, you. Uh, we'll, we'll keep on the discussion with the outcomes after Clemens too, as I shared, but um, great comments and a terrific presentation. And we're gonna introduce our friend Paul, Paul Coe to the, 
um, to the podium who's we're going to transition with, with case presentations as well as uh, data too and uh, Paul is an excellent complex operator here to share experience with our CSIRO. Thank you David. Uh, my, my task is easy. Uh, I, I share the same doubt as Stefan that in the beginning I thought a thin straw stent is that really uh, good but then uh, at the end of the day I think as an interventionalist it's to get the device there sweet swift successfully quick without any complication. So I'll just show you quickly a case of uh, zero usage in the daily practice. These are my disclosures. So uh, this is Mr. Lin, 71-year-old gentleman with a CAD risk factors of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, and a strong family history. He had uh, suffered from FN angina for 10 years, aggravated to a, a situation of functional class 3 since July 2017. Um, he uh, s s uh, had one episode of severe resting chest pain in August, and at that time he was rushed to ER and uh, non STEMI was diagnosed because of the ST uh, deviation on the electrocardiograms and positive markers. So at that time he was uh, taken into a diagnostic NGO and the three vessel disease was found. He was uh, uh, referred for, to <coughs> surgery, but the family and the patient strongly uh, declined this uh, suggestion. So uh, after this episode, uh, he was put, of course, on a strong DAPT plus other optical medical treatment. He was asked to quit his cigarettes, uh, the, but still the angina is the same, functional three. And uh, I think the uh, uh, clinic uh, physician is very, I think the nerve is very strong. He sent him for a treadmill test, and of course the treadmill is positive, and this happened in a very low uh, threshold. Cardiac at the time shows a normal LV function, and uh, his relatively uh, normal renal uh, function uh, was also observed. Um, so we decided to send him for PCI, and uh, uh, just by coincidence, and the, this was a case of uh, live transmission last year to TCT Denver. Um, so let's look at the baseline angiogram. You can see he had a relatively non-dominant right coronary, which is probably uh, functionally occluded with some intracoronary collaterals here. And this is the right, uh, I'm sorry, the left. You can see, without any contrast, you can see this calcification. The vessel is very tortuous, and the shape and curve is not natural. This is the uh, common sign of a heavily calcified segment of disease. You can see this proximal LAD. The circumflex is also diseased. You can see the distal circ is also functionally occluded, but this large OM is also narrowed here, supplying the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And this is the uh, spider view of the same left coronary. So the summary is that uh, the patient suffered from uh, proximal LAD disease with severe tortuosity and calcification. Also, a large OM needs to be dealt with, which is also tortuous and calcified. The distal cirque is occluded, but the uh, bridging collateral and the small territory probably will make us uh, decide to leave it. And the right corner is non-dominant. So the interventional strategy set for this patient is to have a uh, transfemoral approach. Uh, we anticipating rotor stenting. The target will be LAD and OM only. Uh, of course, we will use the IVUS and uh, with the provisional IBP support on a patient with this kind of circulation. And we have to remember this is a live case transmission, and the slot is only uh, 50 minutes. So uh, this is the setup, the left side guide. You can see with the wiring LAD, we try to IVUS in the beginning, but you can see it's so difficult to push. This is a Boston Scientific uh, uh, Atlantis. So you can see it's very difficult to cross this uh, segment of calcium. But uh, anyway, we uh, IVUS the proximal part of it. You can see heavy chunk of calcium. Sorry for the speed because uh, for the time of the presentation, I, I make the frame speed to be quicker. But you can see heavily calcified uh, somewhere maybe more than, uh, I mean, uh, 360 degrees, all the way up to the ostium, okay? And uh, of course, we want to have the circumflex. So uh, this is the wiring of the circ. You can see the vessel is so tortuous, and uh, even with the wiring, the LED to stabilize the system, it still take a time, uh, took us a while to actually wire into the circumflex. Yeah, so it's a very, very tortuous course of the circumflex. So, <clears throat> of course, we attempt, we, we try to IVUS this uh, OM, but you can see at this time, 
even the probe cannot be passed into the circumflex uh, because of this tortuosity and the calcification. So we decided to start with the rotor to the LED first. We pull out the circumflex wire, it changed the wire into the rotor wire, and this is the passage of the uh, 175 burr at a high speed. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's uh, 180. So the bird finally passed through this point. Okay, and uh, I'm sorry. And this is what? Uh, okay, so this is after rotation. Um, I'm sorry. This is pre dilatation You can see even with the passage of the rotor burr, the balloon is very difficult to inflate. And you can see this curvature even with the balloon inflated. So obviously, this is a very tortuous and a very uh, heavy and rigid lead pipe kind of uh, anatomy. Uh, so after that, we put our stand. And this is the position of the Osiro stand. So even with this uh, very tortuous and uh, hard and rigid segment, the stand can still pass very smoothly. And also, I think, uh, very importantly, is that the radial opacity, in my view, is actually optimal, so that we can see we can be very accurate and avoid standing across the circumflex ostium. And this is the inflation, uh, deployment of the stand and post dilatation. And after, the flow is good. And then, we switch the wire into the circumflex, we take the uh, LED wire back into the circumflex. And this was the uh, rotablation into the circumflex. Again, uh, at high speed, and this is a 1.5 burr. And after that, we did uh, pre dilatation and this is again the zero stand deployment. So uh, again, the stand can be delivered very easily uh, after rotablation, of course. But this segment is so tortuous and heavily calcified. I, I would say with the other kind of stand, maybe we will struggle for more, more time than uh, when we are using the Osiro. So this is the final shot of the circumflex from the spider. The final ivus I will show you here. This is the pullback from LED. Of course, there's still some disease distal to this uh, stented segment. But you can see the stand is well opposed and the expansion is optimal. All this calcium had been pushed back. Here, maybe with some oval uh, shape, but still the opposition of the struts are very good. There's no malopposition of the stand struts. And this is the IVUS pullback from the OM distally, again showing a very good opposition and expansion of the stent in a, a segment of very tortuous and heavily calcified coronary artery. So the clinical course after this treatment, uh, the procedure was 65 minutes. We used minimal amount of contrast and the uh, radiation exposure is ac acceptable. Patient was discharged the next day. The patient's uh, angina uh, improved significantly. Now it's functional zero to one. And the thallium scan in uh, January this year showed only mild inferior ischemia, which we will just leave it alone. And the patient is continuing the out, uh, outpatient uh, follow-up. So in summary, I think Osiro provides excellent lesion crossability thanks to its thin strut and coating profile overall, and also the delivery system. Uh, there is a wide uh, length and diameter selection metrics so that uh, it's easier and more efficient for the operator and procedures. Optimal conformability, maintaining the vessel curvature in a lesion like this, and possibly late, uh, less late stent fracture can be expected because of this flexibility of the device. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And again, if uh, anyone has comments, I remember that case, Paul, actually from TCT. Congratulations. I, I was, a, I think, a panel member at the time. Um, just a, your, your case illustrates, though, um, great scaffolding properties and radial strength of the stent uh, that you demonstrate by IVIS. And I only bring it up because you mentioned it at the introduction, and Stefan, you did too. Um, but uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that issue is, is one that's resolved. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and for both of you, using the stent in routine clinical practice too, is it distinctively different in deliverability as well? 
Well, if I have doubt in deliverability in a lesion, I would choose for zero. Yeah. That, that's my take. Just another comment on the uh, strut thickness. I think it has been resolved for, for this standard and for, for some other standards, but it's not a default uh, truth. It's not, not a class effect. It's not a class yeah. effect. It needs to be proven. Yeah. The uh, it's comments. Did you have a comment? No, I uh, completely agree with uh, this uh, comments about these comments about the deliverability. I was still thinking about the the registry data that we have seen, where yeah. one of the mm. stands that really had a very low restenosis rate is actually a stand that I know from my personal practice is not that easy for deliverability mm. and uh, sometimes may be used in easier yeah. lesions. While the Osiris really really a, 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 a kind of Ferrari yeah. device that you use in um, yeah the most challenging lesions which could have some impact if you look in the registry data on restenosis. So this is almost like a negative bias because yeah. you would choose the, this device for the most complex, most, most difficult ones. It's not a level playing field, in other words. No. Um, is there a way to adjust for that in any yeah. way? Yeah. yeah, so the curves that I showed were mainly unadjusted because those, those are the true event rates. I yeah. think that's important. Mm. But you need to absolutely keep in mind that this is a lot of selection by going, going into that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you can adjust for it, absolutely. But yeah, well, the beautiful data that you showed with yeah. all the adjustment, yeah. and mm. it's great that you have the 250 yeah. parameters yeah. to correct for, or to, or to choose from mm -hmm. parameters to correct. It's, um, it's striking, too, that while um, ideally the composite of lower cardiac death, lower MI, lower TLR, all should be motivational for us, um, to, and lower stent thrombosis should be uh, motivational for us to select a particular drug-eluting stent, um, I'm always interested and in, in surprised that in surveys of interventional cardiologists globally, yeah. uh, one of the main factors, if not the main factor the, for preferences, is deliverability itself. And I think that's, I'm, I'm hoping that's against the assumption that everything else is the same. But um, I do know that uh, at least one major manufacturer of DES uses this um, prokinetic energy backbone as their comparator stent um, for deliverability testing. Um, so, so thank you, Paul. And I know we're going to come back to you here in just a few moments, but we'll transition uh, to another part of uh, clinical research with Clemens, and thanks, Clemens, um, to discuss some late-breaking data here at PCR with regard to randomized clinical trial data of durable polymer versus bioresorbable polymer drug-eluting stents. Thank you, Clemens. Thank you, David. Ladies and gentlemen, these are my conflicts of interest. We heard about the thin strut uh, thickness of the Osiris stand, and it's, it's more than uh, well known that this is an important parameter, not only for stent thrombosis, but also for the amount of new intimal ingrowth in uh, stents. And of the contemporary drug eluting stents, we see that the Osiris stand is really among the thinnest struts available. And when we compare that with the early generation biodegradable polymer stands, it's quite evident that there might be a difference. So the Osiris stand has not only this very thin uh, strut thickness, but also a unique <coughs> coating, which is uh, conformal, but it's asymmetrical, so it's more on the abluminal side, and it's a combination of a, a extremely thin passive layer plus the uh, serolimus eluting uh, biodegradable polymer that's really very slowly degraded and provokes um, uh, a very limited inflammatory response. So when we want to learn about a new device, we should look at the most complex lesions. This is a selection of patients, which I believe are from the Bioresort 23 trial. And um, in order to, to get this kind of uh, patients into your studies, you have really to study all commerce. I will focus on two studies, the bioscience study and uh, the, the Bioresort trial. And please allow me to start with our own uh, study the, the bioresource trial and the two-year data have been reported by Dr. Kark from our group. Um, just uh, yesterday, the bioresource uh, is a trial in 3,514 all-commerce with a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomization um, between uh, three types of um, stents, two very thin strut uh, biodegradable polymer stents, the Ozara and the Senji, and, um, and the, com uh, the, the reference device, Resolute Integrity Durable Polymer Thin Strut Stand. 
As mentioned, the two-year data have been reported and the primary endpoint is target vessel failure. Um, at two years, uh, almost 99% of the follow-up data were available, which is, I think, for such a, an all-comma trial, a, a very high rate. Just to recall some of the baseline uh, characteristics, 70% um, of the patients had an ACS and a, a huge proportion, approximately 30% of all O-commerce had a steel evasion MI with many complex lesions, as you may expect, and many patients with uh, severely calcified lesions. post dilatation was um, performed more frequently than in most other trials. More than 70% of the patients received a post dilatation of the stint. These are the data um, at one year uh, showing non-inferiority of Osiris compared to the uh, Sotoran saluting resolute integrity stint. These data have been published previously and reported at TCT as a laybreaker. And these are the data reported by Dr. Koch yesterday um, showing uh, no statistically significant difference, um, but a numeric difference, as you see. And Rosario is the curve in red, 6.6% target vessel failure at two years uh, versus resolute integrity, 8.3% at uh, two years. These are the components of the primary endpoint, cardiac death, target vessel MI, target vessel revascularization, uh, statistically no uh, significant difference but we looked also at secondary endpoints, among them target lesion failure, which is a composite endpoint that by many other trials is used as, a, as their main or primary endpoint. And we see here the data at two years. Um, there is a kind of pattern. We see that the two lines after one year tend to diverge in a way, but that was statistically not significant. Um, with a p-value of 0.09 for Zyra versus Resolute Integrity. And we performed a landmark analysis, and that showed um, at one year, for the second year of follow-up, a statistically significant difference in target lesion failure in favor of Ozyro as compared to resolute integrity with a TLF rate during the second year in more than 1,000 all-comers of the complexity as described of 1.1%. And that was driven mainly by a difference in uh, target lesion revascularization. That was all statistically, also statistically significant in this landmark analysis for the second year of follow-up with a p-value of 0.04%, 0.6% target lesion revascularization in the Ozyro group as compared to one5 in the resolute integrity stand arm. Then we should look at, at the stent thrombosis, uh, definite or probable, at two years. And uh, we see, as you may expect, because stent thrombosis is clearly underpowered for, um, or the study is underpowered for the assessment of stent thrombosis. Nevertheless, it's interesting to look at that. And we see that the stent thrombosis rate was 0.6% in this Orcoma population, which is, which is qu uh, quite, quite close to the, what we have seen from uh, Stephen James uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, confirming actually the, the, these, uh, these data and uh, corroborating uh, these data. And uh, we see that uh, for the other devices, also excellent results were achieved, but 0.6% uh, at two years for all commerce is really a, a, a very good result. We concluded then for the bioresort um, trial at two years that the combination of very thin strut stands with biodegradable polymers was associated with safety and efficacy um, that during the first two years from implantation were similar to durable polymer coatings as the primary endpoint did not differ statistically significantly and the landmark analysis provided a signal that the use of biodegradable polymer serolimus eluting Osiris stands might reduce the risk of a repeat vascularization after the first year of follow-up. We must be careful because the, power, the, um, the study is not powered for this assessment. Uh, it's a secondary endpoint, it's a landmark, but nevertheless these data um, uh, are interesting, uh, show us an interesting signal and um, the long-term data are of interest. Further details can be derived from a paper of uh, Dr. Kark and Dr. Zoka from our group. We uh, are uh, currently uh, uh, finalizing the analysis of the Bionix trial, comparing in all comma resolute Onyx versus the Ozyra, and hope to present these data later this year. And of course, this is also very interesting to see this somewhat refined version of the Ozyra eluting stent in comparison to the Ozyra stent. 
Let's move on to the bioscience trial. Um, a two-arm randomized clinical trial performed in Switzerland in 2,119 patients in nine centers comparing in all commas OSIRA versus science. Um, and here again, um, all commas were studied. Many patients with diabetes were studied, um, ACS uh, in 55% of uh, the patients. At one year, um, uh, science and OSIRA showed a similar rates of the primary endpoint target lesion failure. And at two years, also OSIRA and science basically superimposed curves and, uh, as you may expect, no statistically significant difference in the bioscience at two years. These are the components of target lesion failure, similar rates, similar curves. And in a semi-subgroup analysis of the bioscience, a statistically significant difference was seen in favor of Ozyro in a relatively small uh, group of patients, to be fair. Um, nevertheless, um, this is of interest, and uh, the landmark analysis shows that this difference is clearly restricted to the first year, um, where the event rate was particularly low for Ozyro as compared to the science arm. And this triggered the um, further assessment of patients um, with ST elevation MI and comparison of the Ozyro and science stand in this group. The Biosemi study uh, performed in several centers in Switzerland is in the refining phase and um, expected to be presented uh, in 2019 in one of the major international cardiology um, meetings. I'd like to conclude that bioresort and bioscience demonstrate the efficacy and safety of Ozyro versus two new generation durable polymer DES. Ozyro was non-inferior to Science Prime or Expedition and resolute integrity in all commerce. In bioresort, all commerce treated with Ozyro and Synergy showed similar clinical outcomes at two-year follow-up, and there was a very low risk of Ozyro stent thrombosis. After PCI with Ozyro, the need for repeat revascularization may be reduced after the first 12 months as suggested by two-year data from the BioResort trial, and that was the 12-month landmark analysis that I showed to you. Outcome of the PCR with Ozyra is favorable, and at least as good as with devices that so far were considered best in class. Ozyra has the potential to become the new benchmark for desk comparison, and data of the Bionics and the Biostemi trial are expected in late 2018 and 2019, respectively. Thank you. Thank you, Clarence. And uh, <clears throat> again, we'll invite our audience if you have questions. But let me just first begin. So first of all, congratulations to on the presentation this week with uh, the two-year data of BioResort. And um, perhaps I'll begin by saying that I recall your presentation uh, on the one-year bioresort data, and if I'm not mistaken, your last conclusion on your slide was that longer-term follow-up may reveal such differences. So, good prediction, Clement. But that, and, and with that, with that said, um, I, I think I wanted to get your your thoughts too. I think the Bionics trial will be especially interesting now because, um, whereas you may not see the differences at one year, still even the longer term follow up of Bionics, if if the findings were replicated, may not um, reveal themselves till a little bit later as well. Yes, sure. We are eagerly awaiting this data. We are now in a phase that uh, the last CAC meetings are um, taking place, and uh, so I cannot. I, 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 would not be allowed to share the data, but sure. I don't have them yet. So uh, for me, it's still uh, an open, bo uh, a closed book. We uh, were looking on your laptop while oh. you were up there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't find the data, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask you too, Clemens, that uh, you, you, made a, you, you make a very interesting point that we actually suggested in the BioFlow 5 manuscript that perhaps these bioresor these type, this bioresorbable polymer um, sirolimus eluting stent, this particular stent or syro, may be the new benchmark or, or new standard. And, and, and not necessarily perhaps in the SCAR registry where you're collecting data, of course, on all stents, but I was curious that as as, as you move forward in, in randomized clinical trials in the 20 program, um, m might this be the comparator stent then? I think that's a fair <laughs> suggestion. I mean, you have shown with the BioFlow 5 um, an ad advantage in, in terms of in-hospital um, myocardial infarction. Um, these data give some signal at least of uh, potential reduction in um, uh, revascularizations, and um, we have to wait 
uh, whether that uh, uh, yeah, becomes even more evident uh, in later years. Um, but taking that together, we can conclude that this is really a, an excellent stent. I think there's mm -hmm. little doubt about that. And um, it's, it's fair to, to consider this stent as, 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 a, as, a, as an excellent choice uh, for, for a comparative study. And um, it's increasingly difficult to, to beat this stand, so um, competitors must be convinced, or yeah. uh, it's, it's hard to convince uh, competitors to, 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 to dare to go into <laughs> such a comparison. I, um, I, did, did you have a comment, Paul? Yeah, oh, I'd like please. to hear your comment, Clemens, uh, because I, we know that with your landmark analysis, analysis that was done at one year, but we know that at one year, actually, or zero polymer is not completely dissolved. So at that time, it's neither a bare metal stand nor a durable polymer stand. So can you, I'd like to hear your comment on this. Absolutely. I mean, the information that we have from Bitronic are not that, that, that clear in the sense of it's gone at 15 months. It's a, it's a process, and if it takes that long, I, I understand that it's also very difficult to, to, to just give one month. Um, but uh, when you look at the curves, uh, you don't see a, any bump in this, in, in this period. It's, it's, it's low, it's steady, and um, after the two years, the, the coating is, is known to be disappeared. So it's silently gone. <laughs> So maybe in the future, we should not just say bioabsorbable polymer, but the way it resolves, uh, I think it's probably critical, not just the duration of it. Absolutely. Right. And I would, um, I would add, too, that I think it's a combination of that plus the thinness of the struts. Mm. Um, and, and this is where I wanted to get further comment from you, Clemens, and you, Stefan, too, from the data that you presented. Paul, welcome your comments on this as well. But in the, um, you, you introduced the BioFlow 5 trial, uh, Stefan, and you showed this early divergence in the curve. So for many of you, this was a, ran a very large international randomized trial of the Zion stent versus the Orsiro stent. It demonstrated the superiority for the first time, to my knowledge, compared with the, a durable polymer Zion stent, and the Zion has been the standard of comparison. Numerically lower were cardiac death and TLR, which is uncommon actually, but not significantly so. And then target vessel related MI was significantly lower. And that early divergence in the curve was due to a significant difference in early in hospital and more specifically periprocedural MI. Mm -hmm. It's also notable, however, and this often gets overlooked, that in a landmark analysis from 30 days to one year follow-up, there was a strong trend still towards lower target vessel MI with Orsiro compared with Zients. So it wasn't exclusively driven by in-hospital MI and the composite was not exclusively driven by MI as well. But what's interesting is that Sri Paul Bangalore and Greg Stone have forthcoming in publication a meta-analysis of uh, almost 12,000 patients in 10 randomized trials comparing th uh, th ultra-thin strut drug-eluting stents, so the Biomime, the MyCell stent, and the and, and Orsiro, all less than 70 micron strut thickness compared with 80 to 90 micron strut uh, thickness comparator stents. And they show a significant roughly 25 to 30 percent reduction in target vessel MI, a similar reduction in stent thrombosis. So kind of similar to what we saw in BioFlow 5, not kind of, very similar, but, but, um, but no differences in TLR. And then both of your data sets interestingly show a reduction of, in TLR. Um, so I wanted to just get your thoughts and comments on, on, on that. Well, I think um, the thin struts um, are certainly important. I completely agree on that. But um, the type of coating is also important. We know from the durable uh, polymer stands uh, that the fluoropolymer uh, coating of, of uh, Science and Promus uh, was in experiments also shown to be uh, uh, um, uh, protective in terms of uh, thrombus formation. And there have been data from Waxman's group also showing for, for the Ozara coating uh, a beneficial effect of that coating. And while intuitively one has the idea uh, it's good to get rid of the coating as, as, as rapidly as possible, um, maybe it's a good thing that the coating disappears so, so slowly mm. from these very thin struts. Um, and we see the lower stent thrombosis both in the scar registry, we find it back at two years in, in, in the um, bioresort trial, and it's maybe the combination of this 
specific coating with the very thin strut stands um, uh, that, that, that's of importance for the uh, um, uh, performance of the Osiris stand in clinical practice. Terrific, thank you. Well, um, we've got 10 more minutes left, do we not? Twelve minutes. Okay, yeah, we've got time. Paul, let's get you up here for the last presentation. And, and thank you, Clemens. Thank you. And um, just as an aside, too, we'll be presenting also the two-year follow-up data of BioFlow 5 at TCT, so that'll be especially exciting as well. Okay, so I'll try to rush. So this is, again, a zero in a more complex lesion. This is basically a CTO, a young gentleman, again, with a strong risk factors for CAD, FA angina for past one year, positive treadmill test, OMT given, but not much improvement. So uh, he, the patient had been attempted once uh, this March. Uh, at that time, he had a triple vessel disease and uh, a circumflex was the attempted target. But at that time, it, it, it was failed. But again, the patient still refused a surgical option. Uh, his renal function and uh, uh, cardiac functions are normal. And this is the angiogram. You can see the mid LED was totally occluded from here. You can see obviously collaterals going to the distal part of the right coronary, uh, suggesting that the right coronary is totally occluded. And the circumflex itself is also sub totally occluded here. So this is really a, a very severe triple vessel disease patient, you see. So the right coronary is not actually totally occluded, it's functionally, but uh, there is a very large uh, right ventricular branch uh, supplying the LAD distally. So a after this uh, information, uh, the patient was referred to us for uh, reconsideration of PCI because, again, the patient and family refused to have surgery uh, anyhow. So uh, the patient had a mid-LAD CTO, epicardio from RV branch, distal subtotal, and also collateralizing the distal RCA. RCA itself is uh, subtotally occluded mid-LAD, and also receiving septal collaterals from LAD. So this is a very complex and difficult triple vessel patient. Uh, the interventional planning was to have a bifemoral approach, seven French. We will, uh, you, uh, we will target it at the LAD, uh, integral approach. If failed, then we, we use the retrograde via the RV collateral because this is the only way uh, to not to jeopardize uh, the other collateral circulations in a patient like this. Uh, we want to preserve the septals, of course, because it's probably our future way to go for the RCA distally and uh, the stage RCA and the circumflex PCI later. So this time, the only target would be the LAD. So bilateral setup. Uh, well, the CTO doesn't look to be very long, but uh, the uh, cap is obscure because of these large septal. You really won't, don't want to damage it. And also this diagonal here. And uh, we started with the anti-grade, and this is actually an IVUS guided one. The uh, wire is into the septal to bring down the IVUS probe so that we can identify the uh, takeoff of the LAD itself. And then uh, with the uh, position record, Recorded, we use the, uh, a micro catheter and another wire trying to uh, probe into the LAD. But it's very, very difficult. You see, uh, the micro catheter tip is here. The uh, frontal and lateral projection looks like this. So uh, it's very difficult to actually wire into this distal LED because the LED itself is not only tortuous, calcified, but also the landing target is not good. The vessel is diffusely diseased. We attempted this way and that way, but still the wire is in subdentimo. And also we started the parallel wiring using a double lumen catheter, but still it's very difficult. You can see both of the wires are going into di different directions, but obviously not in the true lumen. So we think that if we continue to do this integrated approach, the chance of getting the distal true lumen is getting lower and lower, and also the chance of injecting integratedly will enlarge the distal hematoma. So we started the retrograde, uh, and uh, this is the microcatheter tip injection, showing the epicardial collateral via the RV branch. And this is the uh, uh, crossing of a SUO 3 wire through the epicardial into the distal LAD. And uh, the microcatheter can also be followed over this wire. And this is the tip injection from the microcatheter. So you can see we are very close to the integrated wire, very, very close. 
It's just that the direction is not correct. So we use a retrograde wire and then probe uh, more proximally, and then we start the reverse car technique. You can see this is a very small balloon, just 1.5 because uh, nowadays we use very controllable retrograde wires. And once the uh, reverse card was done, the wire is externalized and then uh, um, reversed with, uh, over a microcatheter, and this is the 1.5 balloon pre-dilatation, and this is a 2.5 balloon. You can see actually the pop of that cap. So this is really a very hard uh, lesion, and this is after the pre-dilatation of a 2.5. We are mostly uh, intraplug, you can see these uh, eccentric calcium over here, the branches here. And now we are intraluminal, and this is the proximal septum. So uh, after that, we implanted two or zeros uh, sequentially. This is the distal one. You can see, obviously, it's a very long one, but still the crossing is easy. And also, this is the second one. Again, I have to say the radio opacity is optimal so that we can be sure that the stents had the optimal overlapping. And after two stents are deployed, we did IVUS run again, showing that the stents, again, are well opposed, well expanded, with adequate uh, uh, overlapping, all the way up to the LED ostium. This part is still oval, because this is probably the short segment of the subindimal uh, course. But again, the stent uh, expanded and opposed, the struts exposed to the wall very nicely. And this is the result. LED without uh, losing that important septal. And with the thin strut of a serial design, we are very confident that in the future we can wire into this septal with the wire and the microcatheter for our retrograde RCA uh, CTO intervention. So overall, the uh, case was done in two hours, discharged the next day. The patient's angina improved to functional zero to <coughs> one. Still, uh, re reluctant. Uh, uh, the patient is reluctant to have further tests because clinically he felt uh, very uh, comfortable. But still, the patient has been uh, under a regular outpatient visit for his potential uh, stage intervention on the other two vessels. So again, I have to emphasize that O0 offers ideal radio opacity for uh, fluoroscopic uh, visualization. This is very uh, important, especially in calcified lesions for your optimal stand overlapping. And the radio strength, again, is sufficient, preventing acute recoil. And I think generally the strut position is very good despite a overall or irregular luminal surface because of the underlying eccentric plaque. Thank you. Paul, thank you. I think um, if, if we were doing that case at our institution, we might have tried an integrated dissection reentry with yeah. the Stingray technology, yeah. but it would even be difficult. Uh, with the septal. calcification and lose the septal and the and but the wiring of the epicardial collateral is pretty impressive because it's a high frequency you know and an yeah. epicardial too. Um, let me just uh, provide some summary comments too that I think from the data that both Clemens and Stefan shared with us, we're realizing the best outcomes ever uh, with drug eluding stents with contemporary DES and with contemporary technique and, and technology like Paul showed us, we're able to treat the most complex disease ever as well. And our history with drug eluding stents has highlighted it for us the opportunities that through design or revision of both drug and polymer and the stent technology itself, there's selected attributes of each with all individually confer a special benefit towards improving the clinical outcome. And if I were to editorialize too, I think that um, we were so focused at one time and preoccupied on late lumen loss or angiographic binary restenosis um, that there's still an opportunity as the data with Orsiro have shown to demonstrate a significant benefit. We just maybe have to revisit or recalibrate where to look and when to look for differences in drug eluding stents. It may be a little bit later as, uh, as the bioresort data show. It may be in large real world experience as the SCAR registry showed. It might be in myocardial infarction and not necessarily in late lumen loss or binary restenosis, although we also see it in target lesion revascularization. It's been, and it's been the introductory, introdu introduction of technologies like this that I think enables us in our next steps to solve the existing dilemmas that we have, such as planned forthcoming studies and dual antiplatelet therapy duration uh, among treating complex disease like you've shown, Paul. So most importantly, um, as we summarize this program, I'm grateful to Paul for two great cases, Stefan and Clemens for two great data presentations as well. And of course, we also thank the sponsor of this program, Biotronic, for making this possible. Thank you for your attendance, too.